Welcome to Sketchy. We take all the super complex stuff you need to learn and turn them into memorable visual stories packed full of everything you need to know on test day. Click the link in the corner or description to try for free for seven days. Now let's get to it. It's time to address that part of the lungs that confuses medical students time and time again, the pleural space. In this sketch, we'll define what pleural effusions are and build the differential of a patient presenting with such an effusion. Yar, hold on to your puffy shirts, mateys, cause we be heading to the Pluribian for this here sketch. Okay, that's as much pirate talk as you're gonna get out of me. Let's just maybe forget it happened and get into the discussion. First things first, the pleural space is the very small space between the parietal and visceral pleura, which normally shouldn't have anything in it. A pleural effusion, then, is simply fluid in the pleural space. At Sketchy, pleural effusions are represented by the wet, puffy pirate shirt worn by this sailor. But I don't want to be a pirate. Anywho, one of the most common ways to organize the different pleural effusions we'll cover in this sketch is by the characteristics of the fluid that's produced. Specifically, we can categorize the pleural fluid into transudates and exudates. Transudates are caused by an imbalance in hydrostatic and oncotic pressures in the chest, resulting in fluid accumulating in the pleural space. Hence the transatlantic sign above our sailor trying desperately to hold that door against a tidal wave of water. Specifically, fluid can be pushed out of the pleural capillaries through increased hydrostatic pressure or pulled out of the pleural capillaries through decreased oncotic pressure. Exudates, on the other hand, are caused by increased capillary permeability. At Sketchy, exudates are represented by our recurring exit sign and capillary permeability by these leaky red emergency sprinklers. In exudative pleural effusions, increased pleural capillary permeability allows protein in cells, represented by these tasty meat chunks, to leak into the pleural space. The only way to differentiate a transudate from an exudate is to sample and test pleural fluid collected from a diagnostic thoracentesis. Fortunately, we have a set of widely used diagnostic criteria to help you determine if your patient's pleural effusion is a transudate or an exudate. They're called LIGHTS criteria, and you will definitely need to know this for the exam and the wards. LIGHTS criteria is a set of three criteria used to determine if the pleural fluid is a transudate or an exudate. At Sketchy, LIGHTS criteria is represented by this buoy floating in the water with a light on top. If at least one of the criteria are met, then the fluid is defined as an exudate. The first criterion is a pleural fluid total protein to serum total protein ratio greater than 0.5. See this unfortunate puffy pleural pirate overboard and adrift? He's sitting in a meat box to represent pleural fluid total protein. And that pool of blood he's floating above, complete with chunks of meat? That represents serum total protein. Finally, see how he's holding up his hand in a vain attempt to call for help? That, combined with the cuff link on a shirt sleeve, represents the ratio of 0.5 that defines an exudate. Conceptually, a higher concentration of protein in pleural fluid would only occur with increased capillary permeability, allowing those big protein molecules to leak into the pleural fluid. The second of Light's criteria works similarly. If the pleural fluid lactate dehydrogenase to serum LDH ratio is greater than 0.6, then you're dealing with an exudate. That's why this puffy pleural pirate is sitting in a dehydrated milk box floating above a pool of blood with cartons of dehydrated milk in it and holding up his curiously shaped hook for help. See how the cuff link makes it look like a 0.6? Conceptually, lots of LDH in the pleural fluid indicates the presence of inflammation since cells like neutrophils and lymphocytes migrate into the pleural space in the presence of inflammation and increased capillary permeability. The third and final criterion is a pleural fluid LDH value greater than two-thirds the upper limit of the normal serum LDH concentration. Hence our third and final puffy pleural pirate sitting in his dehydrated milk box holding up two mugs of milk. If this third criterion sounds redundant to you, well, it kind of is. The point here is to not miss exudative effusions in patients with an abnormally high serum LDH where an objectively high pleural fluid LDH value might still not meet criterion number two.